nice to be back with you. It's especially nice that it's finally cooling off. It was been super hot in Chicago the last couple weeks and feels like fall. I kind of got cheated out of fall last year because we took our kids out of school and spent a number of weeks around this time of year traveling internationally and uh, we went to all very hot places and I, this is one of my favorite times of year so it's nice to just cool off again. One of the things we did on that trip is we went to India for, I don't know, 10, 12 days to visit some of my dad's family which is still there and one of our favorite things to do in India is shopping. Not because there's anything worth buying, but it's just a fantastic experience. There's a street in Mumbai, which is known as Fashion Street, where they sell all kinds of um, name brand clothing and, and various things, but it's all, instead of in nice stores, it's just on tables and shacks, and you bargain for everything, and you have to basically buy another suitcase when you leave because you've gotten all this junk. I was with my cousin's son, who's a teenager, and I told him I was looking for a watch. So he took me to this other store, he said, as you know, the best place to buy a watch in Mumbai. So we went in there, and it's this you know, run-down little shop with glass display cases everywhere. And the owner of the store starts showing me different watches, and you know, nothing was really that impressive. And he could tell that I wasn't happy there, or I was going to leave or not buy something. So you know, he says, you know, I can tell you're a very discerning customer. He probably says this to everybody. So I'm going to bring out my very best for you. And all right. So he hops up onto the display case. He stands on it barefoot. And he reaches up into the ceiling tiles and he pulls out a Tupperware box. Because <laughs> who doesn't put their very finest treasure in a Tupperware box up in the ceiling? And he opens it up and it's full of Rolexes and Movado watches. And you know, one of the Movados actually looked kind of nice. It was black. It was, it was so, I was like, what about this one? And he's kind of showing it to me. And is this, he puts it on my wrist. And I said, you know, is it, is it good quality? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the best. It's the best. And he, he takes a pocket knife out, and he starts scraping the crystal on the top of the watch. He's like, it'll never scratch. It'll never scratch. So, all right. So, you know, after some bargaining, I bought the Movado watch for the kingly sum of $15. <laughs> and you might notice I'm not wearing a watch this morning. Because about two weeks after I got home, the band broke. The watch stopped working completely fell apart, but that crystal was spotless. It was perfect, right? Not a scratch on it. Now, I knew exactly what I was buying there. I knew this was not the real article. It was a knockoff. It was a counterfeit, and I was just there really to help the local economy, and the entertainment of shopping was worth the $15 <laughs> by itself. But we get far more bent out of shape when we think we've bought the genuine article, only to find out later that we've been cheated, that it's a knockoff. And that's really what I want to talk about today. Because John, in his letter to the churches, is, is writing about a significant problem in the early church. And that is, there were a lot of counterfeit Christians in the early church. People claiming to follow Christ, or claiming to be teachers of the gospel. But they were cheats, they were fakes, they were knockoffs. The problem is, so many other Christians were being led astray by their teaching and their example, because they didn't have the discernment to know the difference between the real and the fake. So what John is doing in his letter in different places is he's helping them recognize the difference between a genuine follower of Christ and the counterfeit. So we're going to look at 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, and we're going to get a little bit into chapter 2 this morning, because what John does here is begin to offer some wisdom, some discernment to these less mature believers to help them recognize the real versus the fake. I'm going to begin reading in verse 5, and we'll go through chapter 2, verse 2. John writes, This is the message we have heard from him, heard from Jesus, and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of of the whole world. So in this text, John outlines, we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks just unpacking all the the details and and amazing theology in this text. I don't have time for that, either do you. But I do want to highlight a couple of things in here, and in particular, two different characteristics of counterfeit Christians, of ways of telling those who are not truly with God. And as we define the counterfeit, we can begin to understand the genuine. So, first off, John doesn't begin here by talking about counterfeit Christians or fake Christians. He begins by talking about God and what God is like. And that's actually a really wise way to start. I've heard that when they train Secret Service agents to recognize counterfeit currency, they do it by teaching them to really understand real currency, to know the real thing so they can spot the fake. And that's essentially what John is doing here. He's beginning with the baseline of what is God like? Who is God? Because that becomes the standard by which we measure where others are. And he begins by telling us that he's going to say what he learned from Jesus. Now, this is kind of a remarkable statement. You got to remember John spent at least maybe a little more than three years with Jesus, and he got a front row seat to the entire ministry of our Lord. He saw the miracles. He heard Jesus teaching. He knew him very deeply, very intimately. He was one of his closest companions. And John is going to take all of his time with Jesus and he's going to summarize everything Jesus communicated and taught him in one sentence. That's pretty crazy. But he does it. He says this. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We got to remember why Jesus came. A lot of us want to jump to Jesus just came to die on the cross for our sins. Certainly true, but that's not the only reason he came. Jesus said that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The Apostle Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If we look upon him, we get the clearest possible vision of what God himself is like. And so John, having spent three years with Jesus, comes to this conclusion that God is light. And he has no darkness at all. That's John's metaphorical language for saying that God is perfect. He is good. He is beautiful. He is without fault or blemish or sin in any way. He is absolutely perfect. Now why does John begin with that? You've got to remember the cultural context into which he's writing. In the Greek and Roman world, their gods were not without darkness. If you studied Greek mythology at all in high school or college or somewhere, you know that the Greek gods were really messed up. They were as screwy as we are. They were like the original soap opera, right? These were characters who had enormous power, but they were lustful, they were greedy, they fought with one another, they were uh, petty, Their deities were essentially magnified reflections of us with all the same shortcomings and problems. Same thing with the Roman gods. But John is saying the God revealed to us through Jesus Christ is entirely different. He is light. There is no darkness at all in him. He is perfect and good. The reason why John is emphasizing this is because there were false teachers, counterfeit Christians, going around in the early church denying God's perfection, denying his utter goodness, making the God of, revealed by Jesus more like the Roman and Greek deities. And the reason they were doing this is because if God is not perfect, if he's got a dark side, if he's got uh, evil in him or pettiness or other undesirable traits, then the standard has been set much, much lower for us, hasn't it? 
If God is like me, I don't have to change. Here's the first thing I want you to see. The first way to recognize a counterfeit Christian. A counterfeit Christian will always make God conform to his darkness rather than transform his life into God's light. Let me say that again. A counterfeit Christian will always want God to conform to his darkness rather than transform his life into God's light. Let me give you an example. On January 20th, 1804, Thomas Jefferson ordered two books from a Philadelphia bookstore. They were both King James versions of the Bible. When the two Bibles arrived at the White House, Jefferson took them out of the package, sat down in a chair, and took out a razor blade and turned to the Gospels. And he began to cut away every part of Jesus' life that he didn't like. When he was done, only 10% of the Gospels remained. He cut out everything about Jesus' divinity, everything about his miracles, everything about his birth, everything about his crucifixion, his resurrection, all of it fell onto the White House floor. And Jefferson reconstructed a gospel account of Jesus that conformed to his expectations. You gotta remember that Jefferson was a man of the Enlightenment. He believed in science and reason and philosophy and democracy. But when he turned to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's not the Jesus he found. So he took out his razor and did a makeover on Jesus and made into Jesus an image of what he wanted him to be. He forced God to conform to his expectations. What's interesting, though, is after doing this, and you can actually still see this Bible, it's called the Jefferson Bible, where he's edited together his vision of Jesus. After doing this, here's what Jefferson said. Quote, I am a real Christian, a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus. He didn't believe in Jesus as a divine Messiah. He didn't believe he was the Son of God, and yet he still calls himself a true Christian, a follower of the teachings of Jesus. That is a counterfeit Christian. Somebody who forces God to conform to their expectations rather than changing their life to conform to God's. You see, when we make God like us, it makes us comfortable. I don't have to change anymore. Jefferson's not the only one who, who did this or does this. I have a friend in Chicago, Scott McKnight. He's a, a professor of New Testament. He's taught for 20 years, first at North Park, and I think now he's at Northern Baptist Seminary. And with his freshman class on Jesus, every semester he gives his students a survey, 24 questions the first day of class, asking them what they think Jesus is like. You know, all kinds of personality things about Jesus, what his politics are, what his views are, his personality, you go on down the list. Then he files that away, and later on in the semester, weeks later, when they've forgotten about that one, he gives them the exact same 24 questions, but this time he asks them to take it for themselves, what they're like, their views on things, their personality, their politics. And after doing this for 20 years, it's amazing, he says, how almost every single person thinks Jesus is exactly like them. Here's what he concluded. He says, the test results suggest that even though we would like to think we are becoming more like Jesus, the reverse is probably more often the case. We try to make Jesus more like ourselves. This is almost a universal human tendency. Voltaire, 400 years ago, said that in the beginning, God created man in his own image, and then man returned the favor. We want God to be just like us. Because if God thinks like me, if he believes like me, if he acts like me, then I'm comfortable. I don't have to change. But John says, God isn't like you. He is light. In him there's no darkness at all. And if that's the case, then what needs to change is not God, it's me and my darkness. The real question we need to be asking is who's changing whom? Are you allowing God to change your life or are you changing God to conform to yours? The question that I need to ask myself regularly and I think we all need to be asking ourselves 
is do you believe that God completely agrees with everything about you? Does he agree with your beliefs? Does he agree with your opinions, your views, your judgments, your decisions, your behaviors, your politics? Does he believe everything you believe? Because if you think he does, then chances are you've changed God to fit your expectations rather than the other way around. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that when Christ calls a man, he invites him to come and die. That's another way of saying when Christ calls us, he invites us to surrender control. Who's in control? You or Christ? Are you using him to get what you want, or are you willing to surrender yourself and conform to what he wants? This is the first way you recognize a counterfeit Christian. A counterfeit Christian makes God over in their own image, conforming God to their darkness so they don't have to abandon it. Who's in control and who's being changed? Here's the second way we recognize counterfeit Christians. John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him into a liar, and his word is not in us. So this one's a little bit different than the first. The first one said, we're going to change God and deny his ultimate goodness and his purity to make him more like us. Here, John is kind of saying the opposite can happen. We deny our darkness, and we say, oh, I don't don't have any sin. And the language is really important here. John speaks both in the past and the present tense. So there appeared to be some folks who were going around in the early church, and they were denying that they had any sin ever. And John says they're making God out to be a liar because The Lord clearly says to us, both in the Old and New Testament, in various ways, that we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of his glory. We have all, in thought and word and deed and things we have done and things we have left undone, some way violated his divine law, his command, his expectation. We have all sinned. But in the early church, there was a very popular heresy going around that is still quite common today. And the fancy word for it is antinomianism. All that means is to be against the law. This heresy said that there really is no divine law. There is no standard of expectation that God has. And if there's no law, then I can never break that law. And if I can't ever break the law, there's no sin. So I'm all good. The problem is, if there's no law, and you can't break the law, and there's no sin, then Jesus didn't have to die. We have no need for redemption. This is why John says these folks are making God into a liar. So one great error is to say, I've never sinned in the past. I don't need to be redeemed. But he also speaks in the present tense. He says, if we say, present tense, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Here he's speaking about those who would say, well, maybe in the past I had sin and Christ has redeemed me from that, but now I'm all good. I've got no sin anymore. I am perfect. So these folks would go, Yeah, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. But I don't have any darkness in me either. I, too, am perfect. I have no sin in me. And there's a more nuanced heresy that's going on in here that I don't want to dive into for the sake of time. But here's the point, and I I hope you're getting this. Both of these forms of counterfeit Christianity have the same goal. And the goal is to not have to change So one side says, I'm going to make God just like me so I don't have to change. The other side says, I don't have any sin or darkness in me to begin with, so I don't have to change. The way you spot a counterfeit Christian is when it's a person who believes there's nothing in them that needs to change. That they are perfectly fine just as they are where they are because either God is just like me or there's nothing wrong with me in the first place. My son Isaac is 11 now. When he was four years old, he was a very busy kid, couldn't stay still, was always playing and goofing around. But he had this weird habit 
Whenever he would go to the bathroom, he would have to completely disrobe himself, right? Every stitch of clothing had to come off. The problem is, after he was done, he would very quickly put his clothing back on and would often have a wardrobe malfunction, right? He, he didn't put his clothes on properly. So, honestly, regularly I would come home in the evening and he'd be buzzing around our yard or in the driveway or somewhere and his pants would be on backwards. He did this all the time. And not just like sweatpants that he'd pull up, like even blue jeans are on backwards. I'm like, how do you do that? And so he'd run past me and I'd go, Isaac, your pants are on backwards. No, they're not. And he'd just keep on playing. A few minutes later, he'd buzz by me again. Isaac, your pants are on backwards. No, they're not. And he'd just keep playing. He couldn't be bothered by it. He couldn't stop. And he, so finally, he would run past me and I would grab the child and physically stop him. And I would look him in the face. I'd point to his pants and I'd go, your pants are on backwards. And he'd do this. I meant to do that and run off. And that's it. <laughs> That's a pretty good metaphor for the other type of counterfeit Christian that John's talking about. This is a person who you say to them, there is darkness in your life. There is sin. They go, no, there isn't. And they just keep on their way. They deny it over and over again. And even when you stop them and you point out, hey, this that you have going on here is wrong. This is not what God calls us to. They would go, oh, I meant to do that. And by the way, it doesn't matter because God likes it that way. And they boom, go on their way. But the point is they do not want to change. A counterfeit Christian is somebody who does not want to change. And they will go to great lengths to make and construct a vision of Christianity that says, I don't have to. Whether it's by changing God or denying the truth about themselves. So, that's the counterfeit. What's the real? Let's take the inverse of those things. Three things that mark a true Christian. Number one. The true Christian acknowledges the truth about who God is. A true Christian acknowledges who God truly is as revealed to us in Jesus Christ. As John says, what Christ revealed to him is that God is light. There's no darkness in him. He is perfect and good and holy in all that he does. Secondly, a true Christian acknowledges the truth about themselves. That they have darkness in them. That we have sinned in thought and word and deed by what we have done and left undone. We have violated the commands of God and we are not perfect. There is indeed darkness in us. And John says if we acknowledge that truth, if we confess that truth, he has mercy on us. He forgives us and cleanses us from our sin through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And not just our sins, but the sins of the world. But we have to admit the truth about ourselves. But there's this third thing that I want you to see in the text. It's a little bit less explicit. And that is the true Christian desires and intends to turn away from their darkness and walk in the light of God. The third critical component is our intention. The problem that John has with the counterfeit Christians is that their intent is to remain in the darkness. They're so intent in remaining in the darkness that they will change who God is to make them feel better and they will deny the darkness they are in because they're so set to stay there. The true Christian, by contrast, will acknowledge, yeah, there's darkness in me and I don't want to stay here. I want to move into the light of God. A lot of people read this text and they get really bent out of shape because they think what John is calling us to is absolute perfection. That we must always be in the light. That we must have no darkness. But that's not what he's saying. Because he makes this practical accommodation. He says, I don't want you to sin. But if you do, tell the truth about it. Admit it. Confess it. You'll experience the cleansing of God so that you might be able to move closer toward his light. The issue here is not, is there darkness or no darkness? Is there sin in your life or no sin? The question is, what is your intent? Is your intent to move toward that sin and just embrace the darkness? Or is your intent to move away from the sin 
and seek to live in the light of God. My daughter is in eighth grade. She just started eighth grade a few weeks ago, and for the first time, she's taking Spanish. She is a much better student than I ever was at her age, and so every night with either me or my wife, she's going over her Spanish vocabulary and learning the words and very diligently uh, focusing on learning the language, and I'm very proud of her, but it's bringing back horrible memories for me about my own years of taking Spanish in high school and then in college. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was in my second year of Spanish, and I happened to be in a class with my best friend, Jay, which was a horrible mistake. We were terrible together. I think I ended up getting a D that year, which I will remind you is a passing grade. (laughs) But one of the problems we had is in Spanish class that year, our teacher was regularly um, out because I think she was battling some kind of chronic illness, and so we'd have substitutes very frequently. But they couldn't always find a substitute teacher that actually knew Spanish. And when we got a sub that didn't know Spanish, it was the worst because our teacher would give that substitute just a stack of worksheets for us to do. And she would just give us one after another and we would do the worksheet, you'd turn it in and the substitute would check it based on the the answer sheet, even though she didn't know Spanish. And then when you're done, she'd just give you another one. It was just busy work the whole hour, it was horrible. One of these substitutes that did not know Spanish, a very sweet, naive woman, uh, Mrs. Gilliard, a retired teacher, I think. And she was one of those who just give us worksheet after worksheet after worksheet. So one day we were out in the hall and we looked in and we saw it was Mrs. Gilliard. It was a substitute day. We were going to get a bunch of busy work. So Jay, I'm going to totally throw him under the bus here. Jay concocted an idea for us to get out of this work. Jay, uh, like me, is half Indian. You can understand why we found each other as friends. And so he's a little darker. He's kind of ethnically ambiguous like I am. So he came up with this idea. So we, we walk into class with Mrs. Gilliard, and Jay, with an accent and sort of broken English, tells her that he and I are exchange students from Spain. <laughs> for some reason, it never occurred to Mrs. Gilliard that it would be odd for native Spanish speakers to be taking a Spanish class. But then again, we all speak English and we take English classes, right? So she's like, all right, so we would get these worksheets all day long, and we would just write down absolute gibberish in Spanish, like not even caring, just whatever, you know, the Taco Bell menu or something, and we'd turn them in, and she would look at her answer sheet, and it wouldn't match at all, but she would say, well, you guys speak Spanish, this must be right, and she would just give us a pass on everything. So we would get through the class, I'm not endorsing this behavior, by the way, I can confess that there is darkness in me, and there was more when I was in high school. Here's my point. I took four years of Spanish. I can't say a sentence of Spanish today. I won't even tell you how I got through it in college. But I I took four years. Jay took, I think, at least four years. Neither of us can speak any Spanish. Why? We were in Spanish class. We did most of the work. We took the tests. We had gifted, wonderful teachers. Why don't we know Spanish? because I never intended to learn Spanish. I didn't want to learn Spanish. I had to be in those classes. They were requirements for high school and then for my major as an undergrad. I thought I was done with languages after that. Then they sent me to seminary and I have to learn Greek and Hebrew. I did not pretend to be Greek or Hebrew to get through those. I never intended to learn Spanish. This is the problem that's going on in the early church. There are people who are in the church. They're claiming to be followers of Christ. They're claiming that they're Christians, but they don't actually intend to follow Jesus. They don't want to leave the life they had and be transformed into the light of God. What we look for in a genuine Christian is someone who acknowledges the truth of who God is, who acknowledges the truth about who they are, and then who intends to allow God to transform them more and more into the image of Christ. And that intention does not come passively. John calls us to walk in the light. That is not a passive command. It isn't just hang out in the church and eventually you'll be transformed into the image of God. It's a choice. It's an intention. You know, a lot of us get uncomfortable with that idea We've bought into this idea that if you 
work toward anything, if you intend anything, if you strive towards anything in the Christian life, that somehow that diminishes the grace of God, that somehow you're trying to earn your place with God. That's not true. If you don't write anything else down today, I want you to write down this. Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. If you believe that you can earn your status with God, that's a problem. Because we know that salvation, a right standing with God, only comes by faith, by entrusting ourselves to Christ, as John says here, who is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not something we can earn. But being transformed into the image of God to be changed, to turn from the darkness and walk toward the light, that's something we must choose, something we must work on, something we participate with God in. As Paul says elsewhere, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out, that's a command to do something. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work within you. So who's at work? Is it us or is it God? It's both. There's a mystery in which we cooperate with God in this activity of being transformed into his likeness. It isn't just a passive thing that you sit back in church and you're just going to be changed. You have to want it. You have to choose it. You have to even strive for it. The true Christian acknowledges the truth about who God is, the truth about who they are, and then they seek They intend, they strive to live in the light of God. That doesn't mean we won't have sin. It doesn't mean we won't have a lot of sin. There are people who look really good on the outside. Powerful Christian leaders, dynamic speakers, effective ministers, and we go, oh, they must be the real deal. That's not the evidence we should be looking at. There are other people who are just riddled with garbage all over their lives addictions and brokenness and sin left, right, and center, and we go, oh, you know, that person, they must be a, they're not really a Christian. How do you know that? The issue is not, is there light or is there darkness? The issue is, what is your intent? Where are you going? What are you choosing? You can have a lot of garbage in your life and be striving and choosing to seek the light of God. Or, you can look really good, have a lot of power and effectiveness, and yet, You could be a fake. I know that. Because in Matthew chapter 7, toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty miracles in your name? And he will say to them, away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. Power and effectiveness is not proof that God is in someone. Power and effectiveness may simply be that God is choosing to work in spite of someone. The evidence that God is in us is that we acknowledge the truth of who he is, we acknowledge the truth about who we are, and we are seeking to live in the light which manifests itself through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, which we are told looks like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. I have met Christian leaders around this country who are powerful and effective and show no evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I've met others who the world would say, they're not powerful, they're not effective, and yet they just smell like Jesus. What are you looking at in your own life? What evidence do you measure yourself by? Let me end with a passage from the Apostle Paul, and I think he illustrates what John is talking about. This is from Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Paul says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, garbage, waste, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. There's the first part. Paul is acknowledging that God in Christ 
is light, he is beautiful, he is good, he is so valuable that I would give up everything to possess him. He's acknowledging the truth of God, that he is not like us, he is infinitely valuable. And Paul says, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. There's the second part, saying, I don't have the righteousness it takes to be united with God. I'm not perfect. There is darkness in me. There is sin in me. And yet, I have been made righteous by Christ through faith in him for the propitiation of my sins. He's acknowledging the truth about himself, but he goes on. He explains his desire that I may know him and share in the power of his resurrection that I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. I'm not perfect. I haven't reached perfection. Again, admitting the truth about himself. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind, I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul talks about striving and seeking and pressing on. That is effort language. And he's often called the apostle of grace. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Paul in no way senses that he is earning anything. But still he is striving to be united with Christ. So these three things mark the true Christian. We acknowledge the truth of who God is in Christ. Second, we acknowledge the truth about ourselves and our sinfulness. And third, we intend, we choose, we strive toward Christ in our life. Confessing our sins, walking toward him, and experiencing the fruit of the Spirit in ever increasing quantities as we experience unity with him. I hope as you go from this place today, you would consider your temptations to remake God in your image, your temptation to minimalize or diminish your own sin, and you would consider how are you choosing, striving, intending to pursue Christ. Let me pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for your kindness and mercy toward us. While we were still sinners, you sent your son to die for us, to reconcile us to yourself. I pray for those here today who are struggling in darkness and in sin. By your grace, would you give them the power to turn from it, to seek you. I pray for those of us who perhaps for many years have sought to walk with you and yet still find ourselves sometimes succumbing to temptation and sin. May we also find the courage to confess that and move toward your light. Lord, I pray for those who don't yet see their sin, who don't think there's anything wrong, who don't believe they need you or any savior. I pray that you would bring them to a place of clarity about themselves and fill them with a glorious vision of who you are and how good you are, of your light your kindness and your love. And may we all experience the sweetness of fellowship with you and one another that comes from walking in the light. This we ask in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit as one God now and forever. Amen.